So, liebe Freunde, sind wir wieder. Ihr erinnert euch. Wir schauen uns gerade zur Zeit unter dem Menü Extras die Videos an, die man jetzt kaufen kann anhand der Bonuspunkte. Und da kommen wir jetzt auch direkt zum nächsten. Triff Kara, Marcus and Connor. Kaufen, ja. My name is Marcus. My name is Connor. My name is Kara. I am one of them. This is our story. I think who Kara is, or how I would describe Kara, depends entirely upon who's playing her. Because you have the option to make her multiple different people, depending on the choices she makes. But I think she, she does start out incredibly naive incredibly innocent and kind of hapless. I'm sure we used to be friends before I was reset. Maybe we can be friends again. She's a person who's characterized, I think, by empathy. She's a person who really, she, she just comes from her heart. You'll never leave me, right? I promise you'll never go. I promise. Kara! Are you okay? Are you hurt? Wait a minute, leave her alone! The really beautiful thing that I've, I've had the gift to be able to do is to essentially build a person from the ground up because that's what she's doing throughout the game and with every experience she has and every person she meets, she's building, you know, first emotions and the sense of judgment and it's sort of an exploration of what it is to be a human. Don't worry. Luther and I will be right here. David and the creators have painted a really intriguing and engaging picture of a near future where we rely upon androids for a lot of our service class business, our, the, the, uh, the class that serves us, that helps us, that handles our, that is our baristas and our drivers and our housemaids and what is humanity, where we tap into it, how and why we treat each other the way that we do. And, um, My character, Marcus, has a really int intriguing journey. Becoming deviant, realizing that he actually has feelings and human qualities inside of him, and it's a really incredible ascension into becoming fully realized and coming to terms with what you actually deserve better than this in life. And not only do you want it for yourself, but you want it for your peers. We've come here to demonstrate peacefully and to tell humans that we are also living beings. All we want is to live free. You know what? This thing, Dad, is not your son. It's a fucking machine. I think that a group that feels marginalized, feels disenfranchised, feels like they deserve and have earned access to themselves and the environment around them, and are trying to figure out a way to articulate how to get freedom. Connor is analytical. Connor takes things literally. He starts in the beginning place where he's very mechanical. Uh, he feels nothing inside, of course, and it's all just a system, a protocol that he's executing to get whatever he wants to happen, which is help humans stop deviants and to find the link between deviant androids. You were designed to serve humans, not kill them. What was I designed to be? Their slave? Their toy? Just say, I killed him. Is it that hard to say? Stop it! Stop! But of course, over the course of the story, and depending on the player's choices, Connor can grow in many different ways. He can deviate from that procedure or not. Moment of truth, Hank. Am I a living being? Or just a machine? Ja, das waren die äh, drei Charaktere die wir mal so ein bisschen am Set beobachten könnten, konnten. Ähm, echt interessant und ich finde die Technik ist einmalig. Dann haben wir Detroit, eine interaktive Geschichte. Schauen wir mal rein. Ja. Und viel Spaß. Game after game, we try to uh, challenge ourselves. For Detroit, we wanted to, first of all, to write a story that would be incredibly bending, which means the most non-linear story that we, we've ever created. 
And um, we wanted really the player to have the possibility to change the story, change his own journey. When you're writing at Quantic, you're writing for an interactive medium. You know, when you're working in television, you'll put a character in a difficult situation, and you as a writing team will argue about what would that character do. But ultimately, you have to decide what happens, and you just show the audience. What's interesting about interactive drama is you bring the player into that conversation and it changes your job slightly as a writer because your job is to provide a narrative context in which the player can write his own story. You're giving him this kind of narrative Lego that he's going to snap together into his own shape. You also have the ability to make your audience attach themselves to your characters because the audience is in some sense responsible for what happens to the characters. It's just a few cans. You're using to steal that money. How could you do that? I trusted you. What is a bit specific about this, uh, this scripts is how large they are. Uh, if you take a film script, there are about 100 pages. Uh, but here we have to deal with a script that, that is between four and 5,000 pages. Everything becomes bigger because we don't just tell one story, but we tell all the possible stories uh, that can be told within this narrative space. On Act 3, our final act, we have around 1,000 different scenarios, and every one of those scenarios has to be as interesting, as passionate, as strong, and as emotional for the player. We want every action that the player does, every interaction that is available to serve in telling the story, and help the player understand who his character is, and build that character moment to moment. We started with the intention pretty early on that we would never lie to the player. So we implemented a visible tree structure in the game that players can consult during a scene or at the end of it, which shows exactly what they did and what they missed. There are games out there offering world exploration. We offer narrative exploration. You know, keeping control of such a, a wide and, and, and large story is is a huge challenge. So. Same thing when you shoot with actors, um, because you will need to shoot many different versions of each dialogue, of each scene. For actors, it's a huge, huge challenge. Because of the style of the game, you have so many different ways that the character can go. Every decision, it's what I call kind of choose your own adventure. Like every decision that the player makes, it's going to open up 40 more pages of material and experience that ties in, which means as a performer, you have to try to continue to make things feel real that the player might not ever see, but also that are in, in performance it's not always connected to a previous act. It's grueling, it's hard work, but it's a great team and, and I enjoy doing it. I was really frustrated, I was, until I got to this point where I kind of was able to step outside of my own experience and even in a lot of ways my own process and be able to step outside of that and okay, okay, this is something new, what do you need? How do I meet you there? How do I give you what you need and still feel like I'm doing what's right? And once I did that, then all of a sudden it got really fun. It was much freer and uh, having to approach it in a new way and think about the player and think about how it serves them and what I'm doing for them or what I'm letting them into. It's really, I think, uh, helped me grow in general. Remember, there's nothing on the left. That's, that's all. So it's probably all there. And then make a come first, close. But I think you would go first to check that it's safe. OK, sure. The most enjoyable thing about working in performance capture on this kind of project is that if I shot a film, I would get to do one of these endings. I get to do so many different things as Connor. Your head goes all over the place because you're trying to keep track of basically four different storylines for each different response. What's the name of my dog? Buddy? Scout. I think it's Jack. I, I can't remember. So I, I worked with physicality a lot because it was a good way to anchor myself in these different rings of the tree. As the story grows out, I know where that is physically in my body, and then I can switch more continually on set, and it'll be entirely up to the player to determine 
what order those things come out and what they look like from a distance, like if you're playing through it, um, the culmination of all of that will be their version of Connor. I'm faster than you, and I don't feel pain. You don't stand a chance against me. Listen, asshole. If it was up to me, I'd throw the lot of you in a dumpster and light a match to it. Tourner les scènes d'action à... Shooting action scenes at Quantic Dream is a real challenge because these are scenes where the storytelling has to continue. It's not an action scene just to have a dose of adrenaline. The stunts have huge consequences on the rest of the story. It's really a moment where we implicate the player and tell him that the choices he makes during an action scene will have a direct impact on the evolution of his story. My biggest challenge on Detroit has been managing the large number of animations that we received from motion capture. Detroit features more than 37,000 animations, which is a huge amount to handle on a daily basis. You have to realize that the player, in his first playthrough, will miss certain scenes. This also means that we had to think of, conceive, and produce all the potential story paths. The character's costumes, the places, day or night, the weather. Did the character get shot in the shoulder? Did he get injured? All this consistency forced us to produce a lot of graphic assets in order to, quite simply, allow the player to have true continuity throughout the story. Honestly, we were even uh, surprised by the, the challenges that come with such a big tree structure. And uh, we, did, uh, we did our best to guarantee quality across all the, all the game and make sure that whatever path you choose within this narrative space, you will have an equally good experience. Wahnsinn, was da für ein Aufwand hintersteckt. Aber ich meine, das Resultat haben wir ja gesehen. Es ist der Wahnsinn. So, die Entstehung von Detroit. Ich würde es eher sagen, wir machen mal Detroit Kurzfilm. Viel Spaß. For starters, what should I call you? I'm Chloe. And you, what's your name? Oh, uh, John. My name is John. Delighted to meet you, John. Could you tell us a little about yourself and what you can do, Chloe? Of course. I'm the first personal assistant built by CyberLife. I take care of most everyday tasks like cooking, housework, or managing your appointments, for example. Mm. And I understand you're the first android to have passed the Turing test. Could you tell us a little more about that? I really didn't do much, you know. I just spoke with a few humans to see if they could tell the difference between me and a real person. But it was a really interesting experience. But this is the first time in history that man has created a machine more intelligent than himself. I gather your brain can perform several billion billion operations per second, is that right? Absolutely, but I only exist thanks to the intelligence of the humans who designed me. And you know, they have something I could never have. Really? And what's that? A soul. Das war die Chloe, die uns ja auch immer am Anfang des Spiels begrüßt. Dann gehen wir noch, komm, den schaffen wir noch, den Luther. Viel Spaß. Just a little while longer Hold on Just a little while longer Hold on Just a little while longer Everything will be alright Everything will be alright Fight on Just 
Just a little while longer, fight on. Just a little while longer, fight on. Just a little while longer, everything will be alright. Sing on just a little while longer. Sing on just a little while longer. Sing on just a little while longer. Everything will be alright. Cool gemacht. <lacht> Geil. Komm, schaffen wir auch noch. Den Slutko. Let's go. Also der in der Badewanne. Ich habe mich die ganze Zeit gefragt, wer singt denn da? Da war es der in der Badewanne. Ja gut, kann man machen. So, dann den schaffen wir auch noch. Kemski, komm, komm. Viel Spaß. In the space of a few years, androids have completely transformed the world in which we live. By letting androids into our homes and factories, the CyberLife company has made them everyday technology. The founder of CyberLife, Elijah Kamsky, is a very discreet man. Despite being the CEO of the highest valued company in the world and being voted man of the year by Century Magazine, he remains a mystery for most people. 
That's why we at KNC are so excited to be here as CyberLife opens its doors for the first time. Elijah Kamsky, could you please tell us where we are? Certainly, welcome. We're currently in CyberLife's production center in Detroit, where all models are designed and manufactured. More than 10,000 androids come off the production line every day. Fascinating. Could you tell us what your goal was when you founded CyberLife? Hmm. Well, I simply wanted to use technology to carry out all of our most annoying and repetitive tasks so we'd have more time to enjoy life. I imagine you must have faced many challenges. Yes, there were technical challenges, but the hardest thing was to design an object that we want to welcome into our homes. We had to imagine a machine in our own image that resembles us in every way, that moves, breathes, blinks like us, but yet is smarter and more capable than any human being. Let me show you around. We're here in production unit four. Could you explain in a few words how the androids are made? Sure, yeah, it's very simple. We use machines to manufacture machines. The removable parts are assembled on a production line, and then we apply a synthetic skin to the whole body. A human operator checks the cognitive abilities with a pre-established protocol, and finally, the android is conditioned and sent out throughout the country. Here's the result. Say something. Hello, I am a RZ400 model. How can I be of service? You can go now. Our androids are already replacing humans in many fields. For example, they represent more than 80% of all university professors and 63% of all medical staff. Tomorrow they'll replace our soldiers, and who knows, maybe one day, our leaders to make the best decisions in humanity's interest. Come on. Replacing humans with machines has led to record unemployment of hmm. 28%. What do you think about the situation? Uh, <laughs> okay. The first steam engines also caused an increase in unemployment. But no one today would imagine turning back the clock. Artificial intelligence makes everyday lives easier. Nothing can stop progress. What's happening here is inevitable. These days, more and more people choose to live with an android rather than another human being. Does this development worry you? <laughs> Everything's much easier with an android. They obey your orders without ever complaining. They can cook, discuss philosophy with you, have intimate relationships according to your desires. They never say no. Obviously, they are the perfect partner. Everyone deserves happiness. Why deprive yourself of so-called moral reasons when a machine can make you happy? Many science fiction books tell the story of how machines become more intelligent than us and end up confronting us. Aren't you worried about that possibility? I understand the irrational fears about artificial intelligence, but I assure you that will never happen with a CyberLife android. They're designed to obey humans. They're machines. They can't ever develop uh, any sort of desires or, or form of consciousness. Are you sure? I'm absolutely certain. You can trust me. Ja, liebe Freunde, das war's dann erstmal für jetzt. Aber ihr habt ja die Möglichkeit, einfach zum nächsten Video zu springen, was dann auch das letzte Video sein wird. Deswegen. Ich hoffe, es hat euch gefallen und wir sehen uns dann gleich wieder in dem nächsten Detroit Become Human Extra Documentation Video. So und ciao.